Um, so I just wanted to start off saying the clip, beautiful. I, I'm so looking forward to this movie, and it's so cool to see the you know the World's Fair brought to life again for 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 people nowadays. And a lot of the stuff you know is still around. Carousel of Progress, Small World. Mm -hmm. What and you actually shot at Carousel here in Orlando and at Small World in Disneyland. And what kind of little changes did you have to do to make it more match to the World's Fair version? Well, the um. Part of the thing, mostly what we had to do in um, in Small World in terms of the interior ride was just hide stuff. I mean, just because they've added some things in the last couple of years that weren't there in 64. So we just ended up either having them removed or, um, or, or covering them with a piece of scenery or something so we wouldn't see the animation characters that have been introduced into the, into the ride. Uh, on the exterior, it really was a bunch of trying to figure out how we can make those components here, there, and add a piece here, take a piece out there. And, and, and make it look as close to as we could. All the while, what was really important to us was is that details are really important in good filmmaking, and we really, really wanted to get the details right. But in the bigger picture of it, it wasn't so important for us to be specifically in the big picture in terms of the accuracy. The details had to be accurate, but the big stuff wanted to be emotionally right. And that was what was really guided almost all the decisions along the way, is what, how would Frank have remembered it? And that's and that's what kind of that's what guided it. If I could follow up on that, actually, I know you the big deal is that there aren't a lot of there's not a lot of imagery. Mm -hmm. You mentioned like the entrance is completely missing. Yeah. Somewhere in the did you bring any? Did you talk to anybody who had attended the World's Fair? Um, kind of, there were people kind of on our crew who actually attended the World's Fair. The producer actually went to the World's Fair as a kid, but he was he would have been like six or seven or eight or something. You know, so he doesn't necessarily remember a lot of it. Um, we did. We would ask questions on. The, it was kind of tricky because we would go on the the websites, the the chat rooms, and try to find out what we could find out without, you know, tipping our hand. Um, and um, so we were able to get some information. And and various sources would give us photos or they would relate us something. But in the end, it really became an issue of there was a kind of a finite amount of very speci of, of, of specific good photography that we that we could use, and even the drawings that Disney have um, has in their archives. For one thing, the the whole attraction was put together in an incredibly short period of time, and so the drafting package is the loosest one of the loosest drafting packages I've ever seen. And I know that there's stuff missing that they just don't have the plates anymore. But you can also just look at how the package was put together. In a drafting package, you'll see that a detail is called out, and it will tell you to go to another page to look at the specific detail of that. They're not even there. They just hand waved it. A lot of it was that they would do the plan and elevation, and then they would come in and they would say. Let's do this. Let's do that. And then when they brought. They did the mock-up. They changed it again. And then they brought it to New York. They changed it again. And so there's the, even the documentation that Disney still has, which is kind of cool to look at too. Isn't doesn't tell us really what they really built. Was that documentation of the vehicle shown at the that basically had nothing in it? Is that real? Well, I'm sorry. Which which vehicle? Your your the boat. The boat. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I mean, that's that we pretty much the pictures that I showed are about the pictures that we had of had of the boat. The sheet that was basically blank. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> pretty much, yeah. That's one of the things that, but there were no drawings of the boats. We could not find a single drawing of the boat that from, from, the, from the time period. We just found these kind of schematic things from here and there. That, that particular drawing is, was in some file listing, this is the dimensions of the boat. And it was somebody somewhere along the line had taken some dimensions and had done a very simple schematic of what the boat was. I don't know when that was, but that was some different. That was one of the one of the few pieces that Disney Archives could give us to say this is how big it was. And to kind of tag on that, um, did you find it constraining that there was so little um, out there, or maybe freeing a little bit in a way, because that also kind of gave you a little more creative freedom? A little bit of both. Uh, the part of it is is that we wanted it to be. A lot of people know the specifics of the World's Fair, and one of the things that's important that, that was important to Brad was to be honest, to not to not. To not create something that that wasn't that wouldn't be believable, and so the details were really important. But because there weren't, oh, thank you, because there weren't um, a lot of details, that also meant that we could go, how would it have felt? What is the thing that we want to say right now about how it feels, and how can we relate that emotion to the audience? And so it was freeing to not have to go, well, it has to look exactly like this. But even to some degree, if we had found the specific reference, we would want to be as true to the details as we could, but what's important in making a film is to have the audience feel what we want them to feel. And Brad had very specific beats that he wanted us to get to, so we were helping him to get to those beats. How do you feel Tomorrowland will play to those who aren't uh, diehard Disney fans? Oh, there's a lot there that's not just dis not Disney. I mean, it, it, it takes the idea of Tomorrowland and 
What it really wants to do is take the core idea of Tomorrowland from when, when Walt did it. It's about a bright, new, beautiful tomorrow. You know, and it's about trying, and didn't get the quote right, but the general sense of it is, is that they really wanted to have a future that felt good and was optimistic, and there was a, we were gonna, it was good to get to the future. And that's what this Tomorrowland wants to, wants us to get away. It's, that's not a, that doesn't have anything to do with Disney. That has to do with trying to create this optimism about the future again, which is what Disney cared about. I'd like, if I can, I'm not keeping anybody else from asking, I'd like to speak to the opposite of that. Because um, there was like a, a recent film, which will go unnamed, that was filmed at Disneyland. Mm -hmm. That you, you mentioned, mm -hmm. back up, you mentioned during the presentation that there were certain things that you couldn't get rid of, right? From mm -hmm. the actual attraction. Yeah. So in the film that I'm talking about, there are certain things there that were not there when the film was supposed to take place. Right. And that, the Disney fans pick up on that and they nitpick it. Sure. Um, so I was wondering, were you uh, conscious of that? Well, you're, oh, you're always conscious now when you design movies is that there's going to be a DVD or there's going to be a download and people are going to watch it 800 times. Um, and, so, and they're going to freeze frame it and they're going to look at that stuff. But you're not really making the movie in the long run to, for that freeze frame moment. You're making the movie to have, an, have a feeling when you, when you leave the movie. So you want to... You our overriding goal was to try to make it as honest as we could but to tell the story that we needed to tell. Can I uh, just um, follow up on that? You had mentioned the Carousel of Progress, or Progress Land, <clears throat> that the uh, that father has his legs crossed. Mm -hmm. And I noticed also the dog is white. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's how he was originally, but it's how he is today. I couldn't tell you that. I don't know. I don't, I, didn't, I don't remember that specific detail as to what the change was. But I think it goes back to there's a certain amount of things that we're focusing on the father and we want you to feel about the father and that's the beat that the boy is paying attention to for various reasons and that have to do with the movie making so it's about about the father figure in there gotcha. and that's what's important so if some of the other stuff isn't right emotionally it's not what's right and, and that's what to touch on that as well what I loved about your presentation is that you specifically with the, the cover of the guide for the World's Fair you said it's for rights purposes it's not the exact same but what it looks like, it fits right in, and even though, you know, some people may nitpick, I, I just love the fact that y'all still care about making it feel like it's part of your world's yeah, fair. And that's really the answer, is that we know people are going to, there's, there's a people who really care about the specifics of the detail, and, and that's great, I mean, it's great those people are out there, because it also, that also meant that we could go to those people and get information. So that was hugely helpful in making the movie, but in the long run, we, we want to make a movie that feels like the movie that we want, want, yeah. we want the movie to feel like. And um, moving on with the, uh, I was just wondering, from a personal level, because, you know, doing this sort of stuff, you probably go through a lot of archives and get to see a lot of cool things, and while filming, get to go to places you've always maybe or never gone to. Personally, what was your favorite thing you get to do for this World Fair sequence? The World Fair sequence? Mm -hmm. um, getting to climb around the back of the scenery is pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing, and when you think that this is stuff that's 50 years old, and it's still doing what it's supposed to be doing, it's just, that's great. It's just, that's, you know, when you go through it as a kid, it's this great thing, and then you get to go and see how it's done. You get to pull the curtain back, you know, it's like, wow. <laughs> Touching on that, but in a little bit different direction. The trailer shows a city that certainly looks like the old uh, Tomorrowland or Epcot renderings, uh, particularly like those of John Hench. How much Disney concept art did you look at when developing the style? We looked at a lot of art. We looked at a lot of art from a lot of different places. Um, and in the long run, it was pulling a bit of this and a bit of that that made it feel like the, the, the city that we wanted it to feel like. And um, you had mentioned that Brad Bird, which uh, that shot him up in my estimation, that he loved Carousel of Progress and it had to be in there. I love that. Was there anything else that he or anybody else noticed that wasn't originally planned in there where you just looked at it and said, you know what, that really just kind of needs to be in there? That ended up in the final, what, how we were making it. I don't think anything specifically. I can't, rec I can't recall anything like that. So carousel was pretty much the, the one thing that he yeah. picked up on. Yeah. I mean, there were things that we wanted, that like, like the whole Fly to, to the Moon and Beyond movie, that, that, that Brad really wanted to get that movie in there. And it just, we couldn't find it. We just literally could not find it. So there you go. I can't, can't be in the movie if we can't find it. So, so there's, a, there's quite a bit of uh, mystery and secrecy built up in the film, um, not unlike Star Wars, but Episode Seven. Is it possible that Hollywood's actually going to stop giving away so much in the trailers and marketing materials and that the audiences enjoy the surprises in the theaters, or 
Is this just, uh, you know? I don't know that, that that's probably, again, <laughs> more of a question for the studio than for sure. Yeah. I, 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 I put it all together, and then what they do with it after our whole team gets together and puts it together, that's a whole other department that, that deals with that. I heard somebody asking about like the difference um, in like when you make that choice to do the visual effects, um, do it digitally versus building a real set. And um, could you address that? Just like what does um, kind of help you make that decision as to whether it's worth going digital or going through the trouble to build it? The, the key thing is whether or not a person interacts with it. That's the key thing. If it's going to be, I don't want to make this digital because my fingers have to touch it. It has to reflect what my fingers are doing. It's getting light bouncing off my finger, bouncing through the glass. And so that just becomes too complicated. And so basically the first thing that you try to look at is that it does a person touch it and how much interaction does that person have with it? And if that person has a lot of interaction with it, it's going to be better to do it real. It's going to look better, even though visual effects can do amazing things these days. It's just going to look better if it's a real thing. It will do everything it's supposed to do because it's going to do everything it's supposed to do. And then the other component of it um, is that it, it becomes a question of how much it's going to cost to do it practically versus how much it's going to cost to do it in visual effects. And you just you go back and forth. You design this, and the visual effects it's going to cost that. Well, I can actually build it for this, so we'll we'll do that. And it just becomes that that whole conversation goes on for months in terms of figuring stuff out. Um, I played the Optimus back in D23, and I have I got that Tomorrowland pin. And at yeah. the time, I had no idea how important that would be to the plot of the movie. Um, can you talk about desi designing that logo? Uh, what went into designing that? Oh, lots and lots <laughs> and lots and lots. And there were we did uh, we did multiple versions of it. And I think in the long run, it actually came together much more quickly than we thought it would, because um, we had a great um, graphic designer, um, Clint Schultz. He's he's really really good. And he sat down and he was able to kind of get in sync with with Brad and come up with some really good ideas. And it. It took this big flurry at the beginning, but once it kind of narrowed down, it actually kind of into the finals went, went pretty smoothly. And there's a couple different versions of it because it changes through time. Mm -hmm. So um, develop, once we found the one idea, was into how to figure out how to make it look different through time. Yeah, I'm, I'm noticing the teaser trailer was released. There's a, a, a small retro looking pin, and then there's one with the orange background, and in the clip it had a blue background. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see what you mean. So the, in the actual in the film, the, the pin changes. You're saying there's different generations of the pin. Well, you can see from the two clips that the, there's two different types of the pin. Yeah, I'm afraid I wasn't paying that much attention. Oh, okay. <laughs> I do actually have the pin from Comic-Con. No. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but I, they know. showed a presentation. No, so I saw another clip. Yeah. With Adult Frank. Oh, right, in the... Um, in the in this house. Yeah. 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 Some crazy stuff. Yeah, very crazy. <laughs> People haven't seen that, have no idea what they're in for you. Yeah. <laughs> Yanni is gasping. Yeah, that. it's that's a cool sequence. But nobody knows what they're in for. Yeah. And so, I know there's a lot more to the film that and that's even just isn't officially yeah. revealed yet yeah. as well. Overheard that you were at one time an Imagineer. Uh -huh. how, how much, like as a big Disney fan, how much time did you actually get to spend in the parks researching this? I knew you were pulling around some of the scenery and stuff. but Actually, well, we went back to Small World a lot. We, we, we came to Florida twice, and I probably spent, I don't know, I, hours and hours and hours and hours in, 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 in Small World measuring and photographing and will this work and taking it back to Brad and oh, this kind of works but how do we try this so I'd go back and I'd, you know take a crew with me we'd figure out some more stuff and we'd come back and show it to him so I, I don't know probably went back to, to, to Small World 10 or 12 times which in terms of making a film and going to a location is unheard of you just you don't normally have those opportunities but because we were still in we were doing that prep work while we were still in, in, in LA so it was, it was we were able to get down there and, and do that type of work all right. Well, thank you very much, Randy, sure. for your time. Thank, thank you. you.